the first thing to note in terms of how this happened is that it was very much a Silicon Valley election. You know, J.D. Vance comes from Silicon Valley in the VC community. Um, Kamala Harris comes from Oakland, San Francisco in the Bay Area. They were both playing to the San Francisco base and the Silicon Valley Bay Area base. They both, Kamala a little bit later, were playing to the crowd, the Bitcoin crowd. And especially Trump had in his pocket a lot of Silicon Valley insiders from Musk to Sachs to David uh, Freeberg. And, and, you know, and even uh, Jason Calacanis was riding that fence hard, right? Um, Musk ultimately went on Joe Rogan. And apparently a lot of the exit polling, exit interviews were saying, wow, that Joe Rogan interview had a real, a real effect. And, and obviously Joe Rogan's in Austin. He's not in Silicon Valley, but it's, it's powered. Podcasting is the media apparatus powered by Silicon Valley technology. Um, and so there was a lot, a lot of Silicon Valley powering this, this election, which is interesting because a lot of the rhetoric was, we don't want those Silicon Valley tech elites and those rich millionaires and billionaires telling us what to do. And yet it was a, it was an election. It was a campaign powered by millionaires and billionaires and tech elites. And so the dichotomy was stark, but also the, the, the power uh, from, from this little community out here in the Bay Area was, was really quite telling. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of things to unpack there, Chris. So first of all, you talked about Kamala being from the Bay Area and J.D. Vance being a tech guy. Forget about them. They are kind of small fries. This is really about Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, and all of his little mini-me's and stands, like you mentioned some of them, like Sachs and so on, who really were the puppet masters behind this election. J.D. Vance was put in by Peter Thiel. Elon Musk is, is you know, acting like a full-blown oligarch at this point. He got Trump into power and now is hanging around Mar-a-Lago. He's been nominated to head the Department of Government Efficiency. So these are the tech guys who we are talking about who are really owning this thing, right? And so I think what's happened is the tech power brokers have aligned with Trump and they have gotten him into power in a lot of ways. And now they, they, they've bought this closeness. You know, you call it a little community. This is the new center of power of wealth in the United States and in the world. And so these guys are incredibly powerful and they are now happy to wield their power with the person whose influence they can buy and whose, whose, I guess, policy direction most suits their own personal inclinations and their own business needs. So I think that's the first thing that's happened, right? So it is tech in that sense. Tech is now wealth and power and wealth and power have done what wealth and power really always do, which is try to get close to the levers of government. Uh, and they found a very willing person in Donald Trump who is who's very transactional <laughs> to take that on. So I think that's the first thing. And then, then you talk about this being the podcast election and being on Joe Rogan. And of course, every podcaster, Chris, loves to talk about this because we're like, you know what? Podcasters have now got a bit of power and, and you know, we're podcasters. So <laughs> we must be a bit powerful now too. <laughs> but I think it's very true, right? So traditional media sort of, people don't trust it, right? Like how has Donald Trump gotten to where he has it's because people have lost trust in mainstream institutions, whether it's media, whether it is academia, whether it is the regular arms of government and so on. And so they're looking to blow things up a little bit. So who do they trust? They trust people who come from outside the system. And I guess the beauty of podcasters and podcasts as a medium is that it doesn't come up through a sort of centralized and more to the point legacy uh, power structure, but comes up more organically and to the extent it is supported by a power structure, and it is, Joe Rogan is backed by Spotify, it is not the old media. And so people just like that. It feels more authentic. It feels less edited. Uh, it feels raw. And so people are more likely to listen to their politicians when they're on a podcast than when they are on a meet the press style show on mainstream cable. And so, yes, I think it's, it's very clear that these alternate channels are becoming a very powerful way to influence elections. Yeah. And, you know, the question I think has to be like, why are the tech elite, many of them, not all of them, many of them aligning themselves with Trump. And I think there's the stated goals. And then there is maybe some of the hidden goals Now you talked about the hidden goals, right? Power aligns itself with power. Money aligns itself with power. Uh, and, you know, I think some of these guys cravenly believe that they can, they can, you know, puppet Trump a little bit. They can free up regulation in their direction. Their stated goals you know, it's questionable how true they are, whether they're just kind of fig leaves that they're, that they're standing behind or narratives they're standing behind. 
but they claim to be um, concerned about meritocracy, right? They believe DEI programs are out of control, that decisions are being made based on gender and identity politics, and they want to restore meritocracy to corporate and government life. This is Sorry, Chris, the, the irony of that is just so thick and juicy. They put themselves behind the least qualified person to ever be president who is filling his cabinet with people who are the least qualified people to ever run their departments uh, while they're shouting meritocracy. It, it lacks credibility. Yeah. Wh- and, and not just people that are not credible and competent, but people that are themselves been <laughs> accused of crimes and, and disgusting things <laughs> as well, and, and violations of the most basic and pragmatic forms of DEI and kind of so- and new social norms, right? Uh, and so themselves would have been cancelled were it not for a kind of a backlash against cancelling. Again, just to continue with the counter argument, because unfortunately we don't have somebody on the other side here, um, they would argue that they're looking to blow up these institutions to not run them competently or, or in the way that they've been run. They want to fundamentally reshape them or dismantle them. That's their argument. And, you know, you mentioned that people have lost faith in institutions. This is, this is a refrain I've heard over and over and over again. But very, very few times do I hear someone follow up and say, part of the reason that they've lost faith in the institutions is because of Donald Trump, right? So Donald Trump is a symptom of people's loss of faith. The media from the Iraq war and after 9-11 and all this sort of stuff were complicit in a lot of that. Government departments have failed to deliver on their on their roles and their missions in many cases overreached with with extreme versions of DEI and so on. But at the same time, Trump is the is the symptom and he is now the cause of this loss of faith. He has said that the media is the enemy of the people. He has undermined the courts and stacked the the Supreme Court. He has uh, you know, he has circumvented government departments and norms and 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 policies. He has claimed the election is is stolen. And so when people go, you know, you, you have Vivek Ramaswamy and whatever going, people have lost faith in our elections. It's like, uh, that's because your guy has made them question elections. Like, it, this is a constant right-wing drumbeat that you cannot trust anything you see, anything you hear, anything that has been set up to serve you. Uh, and so, of course, they've lost faith. They've been told to lose, lose faith. Uh, and so the, the, the both the symptom has become the cause, and we're now in this negative feedback loop. And of course, what happens if you lose faith in, in institutions? Well, you create space for a strong man to dismantle his institutions and put himself in their place um, and to, to basically um, you know, destroy the, the organs of democracy. And so you're right. We, we are going to find out. You know, we're going to find out in the next four years. I was saying to my friend, you know, in some perverse way, in my heart of hearts, I'm actually quite excited because I'm excited to find out just how right or delusional we were. Is he, uh, is he either going to be an authoritarian wannabe when we're either going to hang on by, you know, by a thread or, or things will fail and we were fundamentally not crazy and confused or is he going to be fine and, every, you know, everything will be okay and he'll, you know, he'll break some eggs and then he'll leave. And I'm, I'm actually quite excited to find out which it is because I want to understand if my worldview is completely out of whack or not because uh, it, it's, it's something that's driving me nuts. Yeah, we'll see. There's something thrilling about watching destruction. Unfortunately, this is probably going to hurt quite a lot of people. But, you know, I, I think even if Trump does some of the things that we worry he will do, that doesn't mean it's going to be bad for everyone. You know, what, what the person like this might do is, is basically broaden the gap between those who have privilege and those who do not, right? So life isn't necessarily going to get worse for everyone. 